It is 1959. In this remote corner of India, freshly dug graves, too numerous to count, speak of an unfathomable horror. In the forests, men desperately search for food as famine stalks the countryside. Mothers dig up roots to fill bellies. Some hike hundreds of miles to find rice for their starving children. But it is the cause of this calamity that totally defies explanation. It is a natural disaster unlike any other. One that comes not on the wind like a cyclone or drought, but on four legs and by the millions. It is a plague of rats. The rats just kept coming and coming until they completely destroyed my entire rice field. Now, exactly 48 years later, an almost identical plague is sweeping the country again. Across the region, colossal armies of rats rampage through the countryside, obliterating rice crops, leaving nothing. Local tradition says the rats pour out of the bamboo trees, that the forest gives rise to the plague. But what is the real cause? Scientists know little more about this onslaught than they did almost half a century ago. That's about to change. Biologists are racing to the scene of an event so steeped in myth they don't know what they'll find. Rats everywhere watching us. And they don't have much time to figure it out. Everything we've seen suggests that come August, the harvest time, there's going to be huge numbers of rats in the forest and that the crops are going to be destroyed. Ah, there's one. Is there any way to avoid it? It's a rat attack right now on this Nova National Geographic special. Funding for NOVA is provided by the following. factors impacting energy prices is growing global demand and one way to put downward pressure on prices is to make more supply available. ExxonMobil has invented a breakthrough technology that we've just begun using here in the U.S. to access cleaner burning natural gas that's locked in very tight hard rocks. We could produce enough gas from one U.S. source alone to heat 50 million homes for almost a decade. and David H. Koch. And... Discovering new knowledge. HHMI. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. On a September night in the fields near a remote village in northeast India, the rice hangs ripe on the stem. Farmers asleep in their bamboo huts plan to begin the harvest in the morning. They've planted enough to survive and feed their children another year. But under the cover of darkness, a force of nature is at work in their fields that will thwart all their plans. Like plagues of the past, this one is wrought by a creature called the black rat, one of the most common and most devastating pests known to man. 
Over the course of three nights as the villagers sleep, rats erupt out of the ground by the thousands, overrun the fields, and eat everything in sight. This year, there won't be a harvest. It's already midday, James. We might have to spend the night here, I think. I think so. Biologist Ken Applin, a National Geographic grantee, has come here all the way from Australia to investigate. Along with local biologist James Lalsiam Liana, they can hardly believe their eyes. James, I thought this field, this field had been harvested from a distance, but mm -hmm. it's just been completely destroyed. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not been harvested by people, but by rats. And the corn is also, it looks yeah. as though every, every corn is completely mm -hmm. destroyed. No corn to re-sow and uh, mm -hmm. not even enough rice to re-sow. Mm -hmm. Never seen destruction on this scale mm -hmm. anywhere that I've ever worked in, mm -hmm. in Asia. Very tragic tale, I think. Mm -hmm. The farmers expected to harvest 4,000 pounds of rice. For, sorry, next year. They got 50. Yeah, but nothing for eating. For the 40 families of the village of Klongkong, it's going to be a desperate year. They are not the only ones suffering. These catastrophic rat attacks seem to hit in a way that defies understanding. I've heard about these things for now for 10 years or more all over Southeast Asia. Desperately want to see it. What exactly does happen? What is the connection with the rat outbreaks? No one knows. We've got no hard data. Just myth and fiction. We need facts. Kaplan's quest to figure out how it happens began months ago, when he first came to the northeastern Indian state called Mizoram. It is a world apart, separated from the rest of India by Bangladesh. The people here are distinct, ethnically descended from the Chinese, and religiously Christian, not Hindu as in most of India. In the Mizo language, they even refer to India as the mainland. Rats, they are coming from all over Mizoram. All over the state? Yeah. yeah. Along with James Lalsiamliana, Applin has been trying to track a wave of rat outbreaks as they sweep across the state. The scale of the onslaught appears to be astonishing. It's estimated that the rats have consumed over 50,000 metric tons of rice so far. It would take a lot of rats to do that kind of damage. Applin is about to get a hint of just how many. And how many do, do, do we have here? What's this sound? 30,000. 30,000 tons. Yeah, yeah. 30,000 tons. Ken's never seen or smelled data like this. Tip them all out. Let's make a big heap. Look at that. I've never seen, seen such a sight. We'll start counting one by one. You can count them, and I'll start at the other end and identify them. Oh, that's a fat one. What's that? It's As a, a way to fend off the tidal wave of rats, the government has offered a bounty of two rupees for every rat killed and its tail turned in. These are almost all black rats. These 30,000 rat tails are just a fraction of the over one and a half million that have been collected. But so far, the government program has had little effect at stopping the wave of rats. This is a, this is a great snapshot, James, of what, <laughs> what breeds up black rats. Okay. Huge numbers of black rats. The black rat is a formidable foe and one of the most destructive species on Earth. Sneaking onto ships and carts, it spread from Southeast Asia around the world, carrying the plague to medieval Europe. They eat what people eat and can thrive in both cities and the countryside. They operate mostly at night, so they're nearly invisible. They are successful opportunists, omnivores who take advantage of any ready food source and then unleash their ultimate survival weapon, more rats. The pile of tails gives Applin his first clue about which rat is the culprit here. 
This sample is more than 90% black rats. They're not that common normally in, in these bamboo forests. You know, maybe that under normal conditions they might make up 10% of all of the rats in that community. So they've, they've increased dramatically here and, uh, and the, the key is they're, is they're more rapid breeding. Rapid breeding gives black rats a dramatic advantage over other rat species. Their gestation is 21 days, five days shorter than almost any other type of rodent. Pups also wean more quickly, in a little more than two weeks. In the right conditions, their numbers will shoot up exponentially. The result is a plague of rats. From the 1860s. In the state archives, Ken and James have unearthed evidence that rat outbreaks have happened here on a weirdly predictable schedule. In 1959, in 1911, and before that, in 1863. Documents dating back to the early days of the British Raj verify that every 48 years, there's been a massive rat plague and famine. October and December 1911. In December 1911, here I received a helio from Assistant Superintendent. You know, a helio is when, a, when one man stands on a mountaintop with a mirror and flashes the sunlight in okay. Morse code. Okay. Inquiring as to whether any damage had been done by rats in this subdivision as swarms were crossing the town. The records also reveal that something else happens on the exact same schedule as these rat outbreaks. 49 years ago. Oh, look how it begins. Uh -huh. When the bamboos in this district started flowering two years ago, the Mizos were dead sure that famine was at their doorstep. Okay. They believe that the flowering of bamboos, which takes place once every 50 years, is the forerunner of rats' depredations on dunes, with tragic consequences. Mizoram is blanketed by 2,400 square miles of bamboo. Like wicked clockwork, every 48 years it blossoms, fruits, and dies. In an uncanny quirk of nature, that's exactly when the black rats seem to come out. This great flowering appears to spread across Mizoram in a wave, taking about two years to complete. The people call it Mautam, and it fills them with dread. The nature of havoc caused by rats on dunes is simply devastating. Not a single stalk of paddy is spared. If for any reason this paddy is lost, the people know no other way to go for their livelihood, yeah. but just brood on their misery. <laughs> Very poetic as well. The last time it happened was 1959. Then two years ago, right on schedule, Mautam began again slowly sweeping across Mizoram from east to west. The bamboo first bloomed along the Burmese border. A surge of rats followed a few months later. The same thing happened last year in the middle and southern parts of the state. If the pattern holds, it's going to happen one more time in the area around a village called Zamwang. And Ken is determined to be there, to see it, and to document it. Meltdown only happens once every 48 years. This is my last chance to work out what really happens during Meltdown, to get that connection between the bamboo flowering and the rat outbreaks. The size of the bamboo forests in Mizoram makes this bamboo flowering the largest in the world. But it occurs in other places in Southeast Asia and South America, also triggering rat outbreaks, famine, and suffering. And I think what we learn here can be applied and help millions and millions of people worldwide. But first, Ken has to convince his colleagues it's real. Right now, many scientists dismiss it as folklore because it's only based on anecdote. Applin plans to quantify it for the first time, but he doesn't have much time to do it. This is our last chance then, James, to see chance. this in our lives. Yes. Because uh, by the time it happens again, I think we might have <laughs> we might have passed on. Yeah, 48 years. Yeah. As Ken and James head for Zamwang, the village that hasn't been hit yet, they move through areas that suffered through Mautam last year. 
In Mizoram, the farmers practice slash and burn agriculture. They call it jum. Once the bamboo veil over this field has been lifted, there are rat burrows everywhere. Well, James, look at the, oh. look at the number of burrows in this field. Oh. This pale soil dug up from below ground. Okay. It's here. evidence of how the rat onslaught unfolded here. Okay. Rat burrows going down here. Mm -hmm. There's a big one down this side. This oh. one's got nest, oh, old nest material in there. Mm -hmm. So underneath, the underneath the surface here, I think. Okay. Oh, this field blows me away. We've got a, a rat burrow on the surface, maybe one every yard. And that, that's, what, two, three thousand rats per acre. And we add to that all the rats that would have been living up in their leaf nests, up in the trees, in the bushes, in the bamboo. We may be looking at, at something like 10,000 rats per acre or more. And that's a, that's a number that's off the scale. I've never heard of that sort of rat density in forest, in rice fields, any kind of habitat anywhere in the world. When, when was the main period of damage in the, in the field? When By interviewing the farmers who were hit last year, Ken is trying to establish a timeline from when the bamboo fruit appeared to when the rats ravaged the fields. It seems to take about six months until the rats attack. February, March, mm -hmm. rat population is visibly high in the forest by June. In normal times, the bamboo forest has very little food for rats to eat. So mother black rats reproduce infrequently. If food is especially short, they conveniently eat their young, further reducing the number of hungry mouths. The bamboo fruit that appears every 48 years radically changes that equilibrium. Cannibalism disappears and rat reproduction kicks into overdrive. Over several months of bamboo fruiting, a single well-fed female can start a cycle resulting in nearly 200 offspring. So take 50 females and they will produce a ravenous plague of over 10,000 rats. But it's only when the supply of fruit runs out that the rats, now in huge numbers, descend on the crops. At least that's Ken's theory. But he doesn't yet have proof. Ken and James drive further west, determined to catch the Mautam in action. For sale by the side of the road, they find a precious clue in the form of a tiny insect. What is it, James? With an unflattering stink name. Stink bug. Yeah, stink bug. They're still alive. According to local mesos, these tangnang bugs only appear once every 48 years, just as Mautam begins. When there's no Mautam, they don't come. We have no idea where they come from. Tangnang bugs are a type of aphid, but little is known about why they swarm during Mautam. What is known is you can eat them. The bugs are crushed into a paste and boiled to make a nutritious cooking oil. This harbinger of famine is also a kind of manna from heaven. After a day and a half of driving and looking for clues, Ken and James reach the village of Amwang. It's bordered by a massive bamboo forest, whose swaths of brown reveal that it's in full bloom, the first stage of Mautam. They have arranged to work together with a farmer named Moya, using his rice field as a kind of living laboratory. Moya and his wife, Mami, are subsistence farmers. They live with their three children, working their small plot. Ken has seldom worked in fields where the stakes are so high. Uh, we are trying to have our own rice field. 
At the same time, we're very scared that the rats may eat up everything. I think it's very frightening, this mild town. If the rats eat our rice, if they really eat it all up, it will break our hearts. One year's hard work will simply go all to waste. In the forest at the base of Moya's field, Ken gets his first glimpse of what's to come. Well, James, we're here. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're in the heart of the mountain. An incredible amount of fruit. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a, it's a perfect food for rats, James. Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Nutrition and the sheer quantity of it. Mm -hmm. Vast quantity. Yeah. Ken is standing at ground zero, a place surrounded by trees laden with bamboo fruit. Over the next few months, he estimates that 10 tons of fruit per acre will ripen and drop. The fuse has been lit. Though the bamboo fruit may trigger a plague of rats every 48 years, it also serves as seed for a new generation of bamboo, vital to life here. Moya's neighbors use it to help him build a jum hut, a kind of guard post in his field, so he can keep a careful lookout for rats right up to the harvest. Without bamboo, life here would be remarkably different. Bamboo is woven into the very fabric of their days. Like an organic plastic, hundreds of items are made from bamboo. Even food. By weight, bamboo is 10 times stronger than steel and a lot cheaper. It's even used as scaffolding in the construction of skyscrapers. No other plant has the versatility of bamboo. Though surprisingly, its closest relative is your front lawn. Bamboo is a grass, but there is nothing mundane about it. There are over a thousand species, ranging from tiny ornamentals to 100-foot timber bamboo. In fact, it is a super plant, an organism that has evolved an amazing array of adaptations. It can survive almost anything. After the atomic explosions in Japan, bamboo was the first plant to re-emerge. That's because nearly half the bamboo plant lives underground. Moya's field is surrounded by thousands of bamboo stalks, or poles, each of which is connected to the others by an elaborate underground stem structure called a rhizome. Rhizomes serve as the nutrient powerhouse for what is the fastest growing plant on Earth. In some species, rhizomes spread at a rate of a foot per month, frequently launching new poles above ground, seeking light. In some instances, these poles can grow more than a meter in a 24-hour period. So this was the original rhizome that came out and has formed the pole. Now what it has done now is to produce four rhizomes on one side and five rhizomes on the other. So you can see the multiplication ratio. For one pole, you're having nine children, let us say. Each of these would grow, let's say, half a meter or a meter and would again give rise to six, seven, eight, nine, ten new rhizomes. Ten rhizomes a year becomes 1,000 in three years and 10,000 in four. This elaborate understructure acts as a natural retaining wall, keeping these wet, rugged hillsides from sliding into the Bay of Bengal.
So for 47 years, bamboo literally holds this land and its people together. Then, in the 48th year, it turns on them. The flowering and fruiting, and the rat onslaught it seems to trigger, may feel like a betrayal to the Mizos, but the mass fruiting is one of the bamboo's most astonishing survival strategies. The bamboo common in Mizoram only lives for 48 years. But before it dies, it pumps out so much seed, no predator, including the black rat, could possibly eat it all. That means at least some of the seed will survive to germinate and produce a new forest of bamboo. No one understands the mechanism that allows all the bamboo plants to start flowering and fruiting at exactly the same time, but it seems to be driven by a remarkably accurate internal clock. The interesting thing is that if you were to take a part of one of these bamboos and you planted it far away, not connected with the parent plant, that would also flower. Even if you took it to maybe another continent, another country, it would still flower and die at the same time as the parent. Many species of bamboo share this internal clock, but the Melokana bamboo, common in Mizoram, boasts one final asset for survival. Its fruit, with seed inside, is huge, 200 times larger than the average. This built-in food supply ensures that the plant will survive. Mass seeding events like these have had some unexpected benefits for species other than bamboo. For example, they may have led to the domestication of the chicken. If you look at chickens as a whole, they're just a pheasant. And there are many, many, many species of pheasant in the old world. One of them specialized on bamboo seeds. And that gave it a very different biology than all the other pheasant species have. Throughout Southeast Asia, wild chickens are called bamboo fowl. And according to Jansen's theory, long before people began farming, these wild chickens learned to reproduce like crazy during mass seeding events. That set the stage for domestication. And of course, what happened was people then, sometime in the distant past, basically started feeding chickens scraps from the house, whatever it happens to be, and then the chickens turned on at the house like a sort of miniature bamboo seed crop, and suddenly you have a domestic animal who's just really doing the same thing that it always did in nature. But chickens and rats aren't the only species who eat bamboo seed. It holds a particular appeal for people. In the capital of Mizoram, Thari, a police officer's wife, had the idea of using the fruit for pickles. Knowing all the lore about the Mautam, how rats eat the bamboo fruit and their populations explode, she holds a popular but untested view that the fruit is an aphrodisiac. Ask my husband. He should know whether it works or not. Even our friends, after we ate the fruits, we told each other that it seemed to be very strong and really working. <laughs> no one has ever studied if the fruit acts as a natural Viagra. What is clear is that it is a tenacious survivor. Even when the forest is burned down to the ground, the plant still produces fruit, popping the seed right out of the soil, ready to spawn new generations of bamboo and rats. With the chance to document the onslaught for the very first time, Four different methods. Ken deploys some simple tools to do a census. A snare and a trap. Also for catching rats. A candle because rats nibble on wax like candy. Tied on to a small tree, and the rats will come at night, and we'll be able to see that the rat has come to that place. So we, we take the grease. And finally, a tile. Cover 
to measure the number of rats afoot in the forest. And we can see their footprints mm. on here. He hopes these simple tools will give him some advanced warning that the population is starting to explode. In the meantime, Moya is scared. He knows what Mautam has done in other villages as it is swept across Mizoram. He also knows what happened 48 years ago during the last Mautam, when famine engulfed Mizoram reportedly killing thousands. At the time, the Mizos, angry with the Indian government's response, rose up in armed rebellion, waging a 20-year guerrilla insurgency. The rebels finally came to power. And today, along with aid organizations, they are providing desperately needed rice. Still, in remote parts of the state, there are reports of widespread famine, though no one knows the true extent. In the worst hit areas, child mortality is said to have increased threefold. The government and aid groups are trying to help by sending out desperately needed supplies of rice. But transportation is difficult, and it's hard to reach many of the villages that need it the most. In the forests surrounding Zemwang, bamboo flowering and fruiting is in full swing. Ken is finding disturbing evidence that the rat population is on the rise. There's a bamboo fruit that's been taken in. continue on. This is just the chamber and the, the burrow goes off under the hill. But we've got seven, seven pups. These, these are maybe just, a, just about a week old. But in only two weeks from now, these animals will be big enough to leave the burrow and start fending for themselves. And about one month or maybe six weeks after that, the females among them will be sexually mature and able to start having a, a litter of their own. Based on early results from trapping and tracking, hundreds of female black rats are busily reproducing, confirming Ken's suspicions that a frenzy of hyperbreeding is underway. Big black rat. It's news that only a rat biologist would welcome. Excellent. A lot of people are disgusted by rats, but man, I, I love rats. I, I just can't get enough of them. They're kind of a speeded up version of a standard mammal, as though you've wound the clock up on them. They run at, at an incredible pace. Their heart races along at about five, six times human rate. I adore them. They're so successful. And they taste okay, too. With a plague of rats on the horizon, there may be a certain satisfaction in eating them, as many Mizos do. But Moya and his family fear it's the rats that will do the eating. Right now, it's a race against time. Will the crops be ready before the rats are? This year, I've sowed the seeds and I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping the rats will have mercy on me. Then I will be able to harvest enough for my family for the coming year. I'm pretty concerned about the, the, the future of the people in this village. 
Everything we've seen suggests that come August, the harvest time, there's going to be huge numbers of rats in the forest and that their crops are going to be destroyed. It would be a miracle if it doesn't happen, I think. In June, the monsoon comes. Three months of rain in an otherwise dry climate that nourishes the crops. Sometime in the next 12 to 14 weeks, Ken thinks that the black rats will finish eating the bamboo fruit and turn their attention to Moya's field. After three months filled with rain, anxiety, and dread, the villagers of Zamwang face a frightening future. They hope they'll somehow escape the fate that has befallen so many others. Ken and James return and immediately begin to look for signs of an impending attack. Okay. We can get this harvested before the, the main rat attack comes on. With harvest about a month away, Ken is anxious to see who's winning the race between rats breeding in the forest and rice ripening in the field. Moya and the other villagers have been busy trapping and tracking. And the results are not what anyone wants to see. We've got three months of trapping and uh, tracking information from the forest and the, and the fields. Through June and July, we got pretty well no footprint activity at all, consistently, night after night, nothing, nothing, nothing. And we come through to the 4th of August, and then after that, consistently, we're getting footprints on multiple tiles. And it's sustained. It's just bang, increase, and then it holds. I'm just trying to work out what it means. All I can think is that the start of the breeding activity must have been incredibly synchronized. As soon as that bamboo fruit started to form, the females that were there in the population started to breed. Their pups weaned, mated, and quickly produced a litter. But the original females didn't stop breeding. As their offspring were reproducing, they were at it again. Multiple generations reproducing in sync, creating a multiplier effect. It's worse than Ken expected. I thought we'd probably see just a gradual increase in the population, but it looks like we're seeing this incredibly synchronized pulses of breeding activity and these young coming out into the population to run around on the tiles and to go into the traps. Ken estimates that six months ago, only about 100 black rats were living in the forest around Moya's field. But since then, massive quantities of bamboo fruit have fed three distinct birth pulses. The first increased the population from 100 to about 600. A second pulse in June pushed the number up to 1,000 rats. Now in early August, they are in a reproductive frenzy, almost quadrupling the horde to 4,000. A fourth pulse will create a ravenous army of close to 2,000. When that fourth pulse hits, the remaining fruit on the forest floor will have germinated and be inedible. Rice in the field will be the rat's only option. But which will come first? The fourth pulse of rats or Moya's harvest? Can we just move around so we can make a bigger circle? Watch out for the gully. To figure out where that fourth pulse is, Ken okay. needs to find pregnant females. All right. Let's go. He stages a rat drive at the base of Moya's field to catch some. There's one. Uh, 
great big pregnant female black rat. Oh, full of babies. Mm -hmm. Full of babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dissection reveals a breeding machine in overdrive. These are the embryos and the placenta. She was already nursing a litter, and those young that she was nursing would, would have to be kicked out of the nest when this litter is born. There are usually a few weeks between litters. During Mao Tam, there is no break at all. This female was due in a week. Ken believes this litter could be the fourth pulse, the critical tipping point that would almost guarantee destruction of the crops in about one month's time. And in a month, the heads of the rice will ripen from green to yellowish brown. Moya is at his jum field around the clock, watching his rice. It is almost ready. Ken suspects that at the bottom of Moya's field, a fourth pulse of rats may be ready too. That night, Ken tries to determine how many rats are operating in this field. Rats everywhere watching us. In the dark, he faces an almost invisible enemy. Listening out over the, the rice field, there's a whole mass of different sounds. He deploys an ultrasonic surveillance system to do a kind of audio census. Black rats communicate through a series of high-frequency sounds. And I'm hearing little clicking, random kind of clicking noises coming from up in these trees and nowhere else. The rats make this high-pitched click. And I suspect that's baby rats communicating with their mothers. Ken estimates that several thousand rats are spread between burrows and tree nests, chattering through the night. It doesn't bode well for Moya's crop. Though it's not yet ripe, the rice at the bottom of the field has already been devastated. It's an ominous sign. It's not surprising given how many burrows we've got yeah. there, James. But look, the, the rice is just about all gone here. Yeah. Look at all these cuts. They won't, they won't get any harvest really yeah. off here. Yeah. It's just completely trashed. Moya knows he's losing rice every night, but he thinks the crop needs one more day to ripen. It's a high stakes bet because his family's cupboard is almost bare. This is all the rice we have left, and I think it will only last for this week. It's very important that we harvest whatever paddy we are growing. Part of me, the scientist part, wants to see it. I've heard about these things for now for 10 years or more, all over Southeast Asia. I've read about Maotam. I want to see it. I want to see rats swarming through this field, destroying it. Desperately want to see it. But on the other hand, I've got to know Moira and his family and many of the other farmers in Zamaswang here. And the last thing I want is to see them lose their crop because they're subsistence farmers. If they lose their crop, they're in for a really tough year. Moya has to make it through one more anxious night.
the gamble pays off. The next day, Moya and Mommy finally harvest, with help from neighbors and from Ken. Really great to be seeing Moya and uh, Mommy here harvesting their field and also to be able to help them in that process. It's, it's quite, uh, yeah, quite a thrill. Although rats ate around a quarter of their crop, Moya and Mommy believe they have enough to get through the next year. They'll be okay. But according to everything Ken has learned, they dodged a bullet. The fourth pulse of rats should have hit here. What accident of timing saved Moya's field? Ken has heard about another village that wasn't so lucky and sets out to see it. He knows this is the last chance in his life to solve this mystery. It's already midday, James. We might have to spend the night here, I think. I think so. In the village of Klongkong, the rats struck when the crops were still in the ground. I went back to my field three days later, and all my rice was gone. And that's the way it was. The rats just destroyed the fields. When Ken arrives in the village, he's searching for two things. Proof of a fourth pulse of rats, and details about when the Mautam began here. But first, he has to see what the rats did to the fields. It's just been completely destroyed. Yeah. See the grain scattered all over the place. It's, yeah, everything destroyed. Look, all the heads cut down here. Mm. All through the field. Huge rat feast. Yeah. Nothing left Fisting. for people. And the corn is also, it looks Ooh. as though every, every corn is completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Never seen destruction on this scale then, anywhere in Asia. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen one, 100%? No, no, no. This is my first time also. Yeah. Very tragic tale, I think. Yeah. Yeah, from the corn. Maze all wrecked. Just as in Moya's field, there was a race between rats and rice. But here, somehow, the rats won. To prove that a fourth pulse hit here, he has to find some rats. And that won't be hard. This situation here is just on overload. There are just too many rats, not enough places to hide, and they're just all cramming in anywhere they can shelter. It's not really a sustainable situation at all. This is a hallmark of population in for a big crash. During the hunt, Ken bagged mostly young rats, a strong sign of a fourth pulse. And that's exactly what we expect, that final phase of exponential growth of the population where maybe 95% or more of the population is made up of juveniles, very, very young animals, and the adults are in the real minority. And it's the young that were doing the damage to the fields. But dissection of one of the adult females they did catch delivers even more convincing proof that a fourth pulse caused the destruction. We have a look inside. We can read it like a medical record if you know what, what you're looking for. Each embryo formed in a rat uterus leaves a scar. Four from that side. This grand old lady 
I've just counted the uh, incredible number of 42 little placental scars on her uterus. That's at least four litters. She's been pumping those out every month, month after month after month. I think she was here right at the very beginning of Maltam. Normally, a female black rat might produce only two litters in a lifetime. This one doubled that rate, effectively confirming a fourth pulse hit here. So why didn't a fourth pulse hit when Moya's crop was still in the field? When did the bamboo flower? Last year. What, uh... In talking to the village headman, Ken finally finds the missing piece of the puzzle. It seems that although the flowering was about the same time here in Zhongwang, the fruit production started about two months earlier here. Yeah. The timing of the first fruit determines everything. Here, fruit production started almost six weeks earlier, giving the black rats a fatal advantage. That allowed the rat latinal massive fourth pulse to come erupting out of the ground. Simple difference in the timing. Huge difference in outcomes. Mautam is a force of nature that can't be stopped. But based on this research, it can be parried. Ken's timeline reveals that approximately 30 weeks after the first fruit appears, a fourth pulse of rats will emerge. If there's a crop in the field, it's as good as gone. But farmers can now plan with that deadline in mind, planting crops that mature sooner, and governments will be able to better predict where and when the rats will strike then plan their disaster relief accordingly. Farmers in Zemwang reported the fourth pulse finally did arrive, 30 weeks after the first fruit appeared. But without rice to eat, an army of hungry rats simply starved in the forest. The bamboo fruit now feeds a riot of growth even as the plant's internal clock starts counting down again. Moya and Mami's children and hundreds of thousands of others in Mizoram will be able to track it more closely next time. They can't afford to forget. They have a date with the Mautam in 48 years. Nova's rat attack website. Explore another ecological event with far reaching consequences that takes place much closer to home. Find it on PBS.org. Next time on Nova, from unimaginable suffering comes a chronicle of hope. Three women begin the unforgettable journey to reclaim their lives. Their struggle is heartbreaking, but their courage will leave you speechless. The story of a walk to beautiful, next time on NOVA. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the following. One of the factors impacting energy prices is growing global demand. And one way to put downward pressure on prices is to make more supply available. ExxonMobil has invented a breakthrough technology that we've just begun using here in the U.S. to access cleaner burning natural gas that's locked in very tight, hard rocks. We could produce enough gas from one U.S. source alone to heat 50 million homes for almost a decade. And by Pacific Life, the power to help you succeed. Offering insurance, annuities, and investments and David H. Koch, and Discover New Knowledge, HHMI, and by 
the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This Nova program is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call us at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Nova is a production of WGBH Boston.